Um, the um, presentation uh, was about um, uh, the uh, reasons, the sources of light scattering in the eye and what we know about that and the physical characteristics uh, of that. And uh, for this audience, uh, uh, it's relevant maybe into the uh, spectral characteristic of uh, glare sensitivity. We have been talking about using uh, yellow uh, glasses or yellow filtering or yellow, lamp or, or yellow uh, lamps and about uh, blue uh, uh, HID uh, lights. And there has been some discussion uh, about whether uh, the amount of disturbance that is being perceived by the automobile by the auto driver um, has to do with the uh, light scattering characteristics. It is very well known from the old times that uh, light is scattered predominantly uh, in the blue. And so if you filter uh, this yellow, you take out the blue component of the light and that would reduce light scattering in the eye and by direct consequence glare. So that's uh, how it comes in to be interesting also for this audience. Well, uh, in this presentation, uh, well, just a, a few introductory uh, slides about the typical situation in, uh, in traffic as I presented yesterday and the reason for glare basically being light scattering in the eye. And we must realize that um, light scattering in the eye see that, um, consists of two parts, uh, light scattering uh, per se, uh, which is denoted here with the red uh, lines, and light scattering over small distances, and that is being measured nowadays with wavefront sensing. And that's not what we are talking about, we are talking about light scattering over large distances, over distances of one degree or more. That's the situation in traffic that we are concerned with. Well, this slide I showed yesterday also, um, light scattering is part, considered part of the point spread function and we can measure it and it is defined by the International Committee uh, uh, as um, uh, by means of the value of equivalent luminance. It's the amount of light uh, that you can imagine to be equivalent here to the amount of light that's falling on the retina, and that's the way we measure it. Well, these examples I showed yesterday also for a realistic simulation of increased light scattering in cataract. But now, what was the problem? In uh, the very early days of studies on glare, uh, this was found to be the case. Glare was explained on the basis of the optical phenomenon of antoptic light scattering. This causes retinal stray light, a veil of light over the retina. As a um, consequence, retinal sensitivity loss and blinding. But then, light scattering by what in the eye? By what kind of processes in the eye? And it was assumed, and this is in blue, it was assumed that that were small particles. But it was known in those days that small particles um, do have very strong wavelength dependence of light scattering. It was Lord Rayleigh that around 1900 discovered this and explained the blue of the sky as the result of this kind of light scattering, small particle light scattering, which has this kind of wavelength dependence, a very strong kind of wavelength dependence. And it was assumed, because there were no known large particles in the eye that could do this, that also in the eye, the known effect of light scattering and stray light was of the small particle type. So, that's it. Light scattering in the eye should be predominantly blue. Well, is it predominantly blue? And people started to try to measure that. 
and there were very, several um, um, experiments done. And in 1987, Wooten and Geary did again a very uh, comprehensive uh, experiment, and they found this result as spectral dependence, completely flat, no spectral dependence at all. And the spectral dependence that you would expect from the Rayleigh kind of light scattering is this. So a huge difference between the two. And it was, well, everybody was stunned and did not understand that what can it be in the eye that causes light scattering. Well, then we started doing our research and I talked about our way of measuring light scattering in the eye yesterday and the new system. Um, well, in those days we found that there was an important, completely different colored source of light scattering in the eye, a red source of light scattering in the pigmented structures of the eye. And you can imagine uh, light that is being reflected from the fundus, light that penetrates the eye wall, is very red dominant. So there was an opposing spectral um, component to light scattering. On the other hand, we measured light scattering in the cornea, which is of the Rayleigh type, and light, spat light scattering in the lens, depending on age and cataract, which is also of the Rayleigh and Rayleigh Hans type. And I will show that result. Here we measured the stray light levels in individuals with different amounts of pigmentation. And you see that the blue, pigment, the, the blue uh, pigmented eyes, um, which have less pigmentation in their eyes as compared to darkly pigmented eyes, those blue pigmented eyes have much more light scattering in their eyes as compared to the darkly pigmented eyes. And we measured the amount of light penetrating the eye through the eye wall in those eyes. And we found that the amount of light penetrating the eye through the eye wall, where it should not penetrate, is a hundred times higher in these individuals than in properly pigmented individuals. Important source of glare. We measured also the cornea light scattering, and we found cornea light scattering to have this dependence, the typical Rayleigh dependence. And we measured light scattering in the eye lens. We did this by having donor lenses, isolated donor lenses, and measuring light scattering directly from those donor lenses. And again, we found strong wavelength dependence, but strong wavelength dependence for backward directions, for forward directions, the directions important for vision and for glare, the wavelength dependence was less strong, but still very clear. Well, this I already showed yesterday, the uh, increase with age, uh, according to uh, cataract and just a normal aging process. But so, in conclusion, we have several each other opposing processes in the eye. We have the cornea, which is blue dominant, the eye wall, which is red dominant, the lens, which is blue dominant, and the fundus, which is red dominant. Well, this just summarizes the physics of it. Rayleigh type, Rayleigh and Rayleigh Gans type, uh, uh, diffuse transmissive, uh, uh, transmissivity, and the fundus reflectance. So these were experiments to isolate all the different sources in the eye that scatter light. So they have all been characterized separately, but in isolation. But the true situation during a glare situation or during driving is of course with the complete eye. And so can we now remeasure in the complete eye and find those differences in spectral effects. 
But then we realized that if you would like to find that, you would need experimental subjects that could separate out the different effects. And what experimental subjects would that be, ideally, that would be very well pigmented. I, I can hardly see this. No, well, that would be very well darkly pigmented eyes. In very darkly pigmented eyes, we had found that those opposing red dominant sources are unimportant. They do not contribute. So if we measure well pigmented eyes, then there would be a chance to find wavelength dependence. And so that's what we did. We did a study with different populations, a blue-eyed population, green-blue-eyed populations, brown-eyed Caucasian populations, and the pigmented population. And this is what we found. Wavelength dependence, this is the Rayleigh effect, and this is what the darkly pigmented individuals have. They have less stray light, but it's not only less, it's also more or less the Rayleigh characteristic. But if the eye gets less pigmented, then the red components, of course, set in, and you get a kind of a flat a horizontal behavior of light scattering in the eye. Well, a problem with this study was that our population of uh, pigmented eyes was not very young. And as I showed you earlier, there is a very strong wavelength dependence. The um, uh, aging processes in the lens uh, add to uh, stray light with aging. And so also in this case, uh, there was a, a confounder that was um, extra um, scattering in the lens. But we did have the age dependence, of course, because we knew the ages of all these people. So we made a model, a very simplistic model, where we said stray light equals a base. Everybody has that amount of stray light. And if you age, you get a bit more of a certain type. And if you have less pigmentation than ideally black eyes, um, you get even more. So um, light scattering is the sum of three components, a pigmentation-dependent component, an age-dependent component, and the base component where we all start off with if we would have good pigmentation in our eyes. And so fitting this model to the data set I just showed, this came out. The base curve is this, and the base curve is almost completely really characteristic. It's blue dominated. Only here at the very end, you see an uplift. But of course, the red component, the component that is from fundus reflectance, has a very steep rise here. So probably also the darkestly pigmented young individuals have some addition from reflectance from the fundus and transmittance through the eye wall. And then this is the H addition. Okay, so this uh, then summarizes this result. We do find that in the basic eye, we do have Rayleigh scatter, blue dominated, but because of pigmentation losses and because of aging effects in our eye lenses, this strong wavelength dependence gets lost with age and with, uh, let's say, Caucasian kinds of pigmentation. Um, well, so this then, uh, well, you can think about this, which eye is the better eye? Uh, well, but that's not what I want to end with. I want to show you one other aspect of this study. I just showed you that we um, studied light scattering from, um, um, from the eye lenses. And as we age, 
the islands get the dominant factor. And for the age population, as we are here, our islands are the dominant light scattering factors. But how do we perceive light scattering? If you look at an halogen lamp at your home, such a bright spot of light, this is what we see. We see radiating from this bright spot of light a pattern of very fine lines, colored lines. That phenomenon is called the ciliary corona. Everybody sees that around a bright spot of light, a distant lamp post against a dark night uh, sky. And in those studies, we uh, explained light scattering on the basis of normal light scattering processes, and all those effects are a kind of an airy disk uh, diffraction pattern. So a light scattering process projects an airy-like disk on the retina. But we do not see airy-like disks on the retina. In fact, we see this. So that was kind of a problem in those experiments we did. And it was kind of, well, can you believe the outcome of this experiment if it predicts that you have an airy like disk? But what you actually see is this. And then we realized that light scattering uh, by multiple particles in the lens, that's the dominant thing, by multiple particles in the lens, projects multiple airy disks, airy-like disks, on our retina. So it's the superposition of many airy-like disks on our retina that is what we get at the retina. And now what kind of effect can that have? That we have just the superposition of kind of the same things. Well, we must realize that all those particles in our eyes are at different locations, which means that all those airy-like disks projected on our retinas are directed from different angles, which gives phase differences between those wavefronts that reach our retina. And all those phase differences give very complicated interference patterns. And we could derive, well, for just two particles is there, and, oops, sorry. For two particles is upper left, three particles right, four particles, and for 50 particles you see this very irregular pattern. And this is what this pattern looks like in a true simulation of this effect. In the upper right corner, you see the wavelength. And so, all those particles in our eyes project patterns together eh, that look like this if we illuminate them with that wavelength, 500 nanometers, 450, 400 nanometers. And what you can see now is that the only difference that you see here, apart from luminosity differences, the only difference is a shrinkage of the pattern. It's a shrinkage of the pattern. And, and that's logical, huh? because all those particles are stable particles in our eyes. So the pattern that's projected on the retina is a stable pattern. And only if you change wavelengths, it's a scaling factor, wavelengths, it only shrinks the pattern. Now, in fact, if you look at an halogen lamp, it's not monochromatic. A halogen lamp has all the wavelengths. So what happens? If you look at an halogen lamp, it's a combination of all those patterns. And just try to follow in your mind one spot of that pattern. If you have one spot, if it's red, it's there. If it's yellow, it's closer by the center. If it's green, it's even closer by the center. In other words, each spot of this pattern will cause a line, a small line segment. And so that's what we simulated. Uh, 
in the next simulation. The next simulation, this simulation, starts out with pure red. Here, it's pure red, and now more and more wavelengths are added. Yeah, so, all the wavelengths are added, and then you slowly see build up this stripy pattern that's characteristic for the ciliary corona that we all see as the basic phenomenon during glare situations. That's the end of my presentation. Sorry for being late. Kies, you should have uh, kicked me off. Uh, <laughs> We do have time for a couple questions. So. I don't understand something. We as physicians always learn, and maybe David Miller will correct me, that the reason for the pigment epithelium was to give us an image of high resolution. So the light came into the eye, went through the retina, stimulated the rods and cones, was then absorbed by the blotter behind it. And that uh, because of that, you get a high resolution, and that's one of the reasons why albinos have a poor image to, the retina, uh, to whatever they look at. They have macular functions of non-development. I understand that. But what I don't understand is this business of light coming through the sclera, what you call the eye wall. Are you telling me now that light which leaks in through the sclera doesn't get absorbed by the pigment epithelium because it's going in the wrong way and thus it causes glare? Is that the message? Well, it, uh, it is absorbed by the retinal pigment epithelium, but the absorbance by the retinal pigment epithelium is not much. It's only 50%. So 50% is transmitted by the retinal pigment epithelium. More, more uh, important, is the absorbance in the choroid layer. The choroid layer is much thicker. There are much more uh, pigment grains pr present in the choroid layer. And in the choroid layer, th there is where the large differences are between differently pigmented individuals. Um, very whitish uh, individuals have hardly any pigment in the choroid layer. So they are faced with only the absorption in the retinal pigment epithelium, which is not that much. And what about light going through the pupil? Is it 50% absorbed by the pigment epithelium too, or 100%? No, light going through the pupil, falling on our retina, then passing our retina, going through the retinal pigment epithelium, of course is absorbed there also 50%, then goes into the choroid, is absorbed there further, is reflected by the sclera, which is white in the humans, goes back to the choroid, is again absorbed, and then again back through the retinal pigment epithelium, 50% again. So that's, that's a whole sequence of processes. I got to think about that. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, Jane King from the Visionary Support Group. Um, I just have a couple comments and a question. Um, when I had the cataracts, which were becoming quite thick, um, I did notice it was a very slow process, and I didn't realize until after the cataracts had been removed. And my left eye is very poor, so I don't use it as much. And when I went with my husband to a dinner at CompuWare's in their Christmas dinner, it was in Cobo Hall, and they had very fancy lights and different decorations around the room. My left eye, which I don't see very good, had been the cataract removed. And when I looked up the ceiling and closed my right eye, so it forced me to use my left eye, I, originally I looked at, I thought everything was blue. I thought the lights and the colors and the ribbons and everything up there were different colors of blue. When I closed my right eye and looked with my left eye, I was very surprised because some of them were green, like chartreuse green and stuff. The cataracts, which mentioned yesterday, many people are driving with cataracts, both in the daytime and the evening. They may drive less in the evening, but I do know people that are still driving with the cataracts. And my vision was totally changed with colors because of the process, as just mentioned, 
where the light is filtered differently, especially blues where the yellow, if the cataracts are kind of brown, they filter the colors and change colors that are yellow, um, blue and green were totally reversed for me. And I could not see purple very well. So after the cataracts removed, um, I could see colors so much more brilliantly. It was amazing. And the difference is very slow and very gradual. And um, it was just totally dynamic to see the colors again. Also, I learned from Dr. Hesburgh yesterday that another problem I have with my eyes, because the cataracts have been removed, I still have a glare problem in my eyes very intensely with the sun. Um, and Dr. Hesburgh said this is a very common problem because the pupil is now changed after the cataracts are removed and the lens is implanted. Um, the pupils do not change as quickly or not totally as they used to. So during the day, I almost always have to wear sunglasses when I go out in the sun. It is so intense and so bright. So you do have drivers that have either have cataracts or will have, have them removed, will have these problems, that the glare is a problem either way. And also, I had a question. If people are wearing contacts with colors in them, will that affect or diffuse the glare? And also, do people that wear glasses, um, is that an added effect of glare, like another whole lens that added more glare during the day and at night? Um, well, um, I guess it would take um, well, another half hour or so to really uh, <coughs> uh, treat uh, all these questions uh, properly. Uh, your first uh, point about uh, the effects of uh, coloration uh, in the cataracts, it's very well known that uh, cataracts uh, become very yellow, that if they are removed, uh, it restores uh, vision of the blue uh, part of the spectrum. Um, with respect to uh, your second question, well, that's hard for me to go into because I then would need to uh, know more details about the condition of your eye. Um, but what we do know, which amazed us, uh, kind of, is that after uh, cataract removal and implantation of an uh, implant lens, you would expect that the lenticular component of light scattering in the eye would have, uh, you would have got rid of. And so you would then have very good, with respect to glare and light scattering eye, that's not the case. Um, and why that precisely is so, we do not uh, understand that at, at present. And then your last question about uh, air contact lenses and, and glasses. Um, well, what we know is that uh, contact lenses, as a rule, um, increase light scattering. Uh, precisely why, I don't know, but most um, probably because they are always a little bit dirty. There are always kind of deposits on uh, contact lenses, and we have seen terrible examples uh, of that. And so contact lenses are a problem there. People uh, kind of tend to be more careful with their glasses uh, because they are more accessible, maybe also because um, glasses are more for the older folks and contact lenses are more for the young folks, and young folks are less are a bit uh, more careless or so. I, I don't know, that's just speculation, but that's what we find, glasses. But also, of course, dirt on glasses that will um, um, give uh, increased light scattering. But as I mentioned yesterday, um, uh, we looked into how, how uh, tolerant uh, people are with respect to dirt on their glasses, and we found that they never want, or as a rule, do not want glasses that are more dirty than your own eye. You do not want to add significantly, just a little bit, always a little bit, but not very significantly with your glasses, as probably with, with windshields. Uh, can I uh, answer a couple of the questions that were directed? Uh, Tom, I think your point about when the cataract is removed, you still are glare sensitive. I think you have to add one point. If the cataract is removed incompletely, and so there is some opacification of the posterior capsule, that will induce glare. Sure. I think a perfect cleaning probably will reduce the amount of glare. Uh, Phil, as far as light going to the sclera, we as clinicians 
uh, do something called transillumination all the time, put a light along the side of your eye, uh, and, and you can see the red reflect from inside the eye. So that kind of tells us that light certainly does go through the sclera, but it has to be a very bright light held very close to the sclera. So. Right. But his point is that, or at least I thought he was, what he was saying was that the pigment epithelium didn't work as effectively as a light blotter. Oh, no, I think, I think the pigment epithelium plus the choroidal pigment is a good blotter. Absolutely well, good blotter. Well, it's only a good, it's only a good block in well-pigmented individuals not in lightly pigmented individuals. And I think th this last point, I think, is a very practical point. You're talking about pigmented people or the pigment in a lens as you get older. Uh, that explains, Phil, why yellow lenses, yellow sunglasses, are useful. In other words, if your light scattering and glare Excuse me, guys. sensitivity. I, I hate to interrupt, and, and this, is, this is a great discussion for lunch, but we are running out of time, and I, I just got the note that we should end the discussion now and continue it as we eat. Thanks for the speaker.